When the bride put forth her index finger and the groom placed the ring on it, pronouncing the verse, Behold, thou art sanctified unto me, all the women began to sob. Already then, as a youngster, I marveled at how quickly women can alternate between tears and laughter. After the ceremony, there was a general exchange of kisses and good wishes. The table was laden with wines, cognac, liqueurs, and other beverages. There were giant loaves of sponge cake. The ladies gingerly took pieces of the cake between their thumbs and index fingers, delicately curling their little fingers, bit off small, dainty bites, and sipped their drinks slowly. This was their day. Today they were not outcasts, skulking in dark cellars, but honored relations invited to a celebration. The men drank whiskey and tea glasses and soon began to stammer and fumble in their speech. One of them ran over to my father and exclaimed, Rabbi, you are a wonderful Jew. It suffices that one be simply a decent Jew, my father replied. Rabbi, I'd give my life for you. God forbid one must not say such things. Rabbi, I'm not worth the mud on the soles of your boots. Father gazed longingly at his books. If only these people would leave so that he could return to his studies. But they did not hurry. They drank more and more. One of the uncles urged my father to take a drink. Father refused. I am not allowed to drink. I suffer, may no such evil befall you, from a catar of the stomach. But, Rabbi, this whiskey is only forty proof. I am not allowed. The doctor has forbidden it. Ah, what do the doctors know? Fiddlesticks. After much urging, my father tasted a drop. The women tried to pull mother into their circle dance, but she quickly left the room. She did not wish to associate with the riffraff. I was given wine, whiskey, and enough cake and cookies to stuff all my pockets. After a while, the room began to empty. I went out on the balcony and saw how the bride and groom were led back to the same courtyard from which they had come. Only when the last guest had left the room did my mother return. It was cold outside, but she opened every window to let in fresh air. She threw out whatever remained of the cakes and drinks. For several days thereafter she walked about in a daze. Again and again I heard her say, that I may live to see the day we get away from this accursed street. For a long time thereafter I heard people talking about the newlyweds. Marvelous things were told of them. The one-time prostitute was conducting herself like a proper young matron. Regularly, every month, she went to the ritual bath. She bought kosher meat in the butcher shop. Every Sabbath and holiday, she attended services in the women's section of the synagogue. Later, I heard that she was pregnant, then that she had had a child. The women all swore that she never so much as looked at a strange man. From time to time, I saw the husband, he had lost the glow of the wedding day. Again, he wore a paper shirt front without a collar. Once in a shop where I had been sent to buy something for my mother, I heard a young woman ask, But how can he live with her, knowing the kind of life she led? It is never too late for repentance, answered an older woman, wearing a matron's bonnet. But still one cannot help feeling disgust. He's probably in love with her, another young matron chimed in. What's there to love? She's as thin as a rail. Every man to his taste. May God not punish me for this kind of talk, said the shopkeeper. Tongue be still. And she smote her lips with two fingers. From that time on, I looked with greater interest at the girls who stood near the gates in the street lamps. Some looked coarse, heavy, common. An insolent arrogance shone out of their made-up eyes. Others looked quiet sad and shriveled. There was one who spoke with a Lithuanian accent, a constant source of amusement for me. She would enter Esther's sweet shop and say, What smells so good here today? Give me a small piece of cheesecake. I just have a craving for it. Sometimes I heard the servant girls in our courtyard talking about how procurers drove about by night in calishes and picked up innocent young women, orphans or girls, from the villages. They were forced into a life of sin, and then they were put aboard ship and taken to Buenos Aires. 
There for a while they lived with unclean men, and then a dangerous worm would get into their blood and their flesh would begin to decay. These tales were fascinating and horrible at the same time. Strange things were happening in the world. There were secrets not only in heaven above, but also here on earth. I was consumed by the desire to grow up quickly and to learn all the secrets of heaven and earth from which young boys were barred. Had he been a Cohen? The door opened and a bareheaded woman entered. It was rare that a woman with uncovered hair came to our house. Even those who did not wear the traditional matron's wig would put a kerchief over their head before entering our home. But this woman apparently was too upset to think about anything except her own shame and disgrace. She was of medium height, stout, with a ruddy complexion. Her yellowish hair was combed back in a bun on her nape and held together by hairpins. She had obviously once been an attractive, even statuesque person, but now she looked disheveled, embittered, angry. She was still in the kitchen when she began to shout, He's a murderer, a gangster, I cannot take it any more. I want a divorce, a divorce. Mother, it seemed, knew her. She lived across the street at number 15 Krachmalna Street. With shouts and curses, she began to relate what her husband, that wretch, had done to her. He did not earn a living. He paid no attention to the children. He spent his days in the saloon at number 17 Krachmalna Street, drinking beer with his good-for-nothing cronies and women of easy virtue. But what he had done now was the last straw. This she could not forgive. She would never forget it, not even when she was laid out with her feet toward the door and shards over her eyes. What did he do? Rebetzin, he gambled away the stove. The stove? How can anyone gamble away a stove? It appeared that the stove in their house was not a built-in stove like ours, but one made of iron, and this he had lost in a card game. Men had come in and carried the stove out of the house. The woman was shouting in a shrill, fierce voice. Mother, who usually tried to reconcile quarreling couples, was herself angered by this story. She seemed almost to feel ashamed for the utter degradation of mankind. She remained silent. The woman began to recount a list of her husband's sins, one worse than the other. Mother was so preoccupied that she did not even notice me. At any other time, she would have chased me from the kitchen. I already knew that people did all sorts of terrible things, but I had never before heard of such dishonorable deeds. Who would have thought so great an evildoer lived so close by? Father sent me to summon the husband, and I ran agog with curiosity. I had to climb to one of the upper landings, where I found the door half open. Inside, several children were playing and screaming. On a broken-down sofa lolled a man, stout, clean-shaven, with a full blondish mustache, wearing a shirt fastened with a pin and boots with high, tight-fitting uppers, such as are worn only by common people. He wore no hat, and his light hair was close-cropped. He looked sleepy, drunk, and annoyed. What do you want? Your wife sent for you to come to the rabbi. To the rabbi, eh? Yes. She wants a divorce, eh? Yes. Well, I won't stop her. The man stood up. He told the eldest girl to watch the little ones. A few minutes later, he was in my father's study. His wife greeted him with curses, shouts, clenched fists. Then he outshouted her, Quiet! If you want a divorce, you'll get a divorce. Stop screaming. Father called mother aside to confer with her. She told him that he could not divorce this couple. They had children. Father agreed. He came back and repeated what he always said in such cases, getting a divorce is no light matter. Such things cannot be done helter-skelter. One has to act with deliberation. The children must be considered. The woman became enraged. If that is your answer, I will go to a different rabbi. No rabbi will grant you a divorce on the spot. As father said this, there was a suspicion of a smile on his lips. Actually, what he had said was not true, but a lie told for the sake of preserving family peace. There were in Warsaw some rabbis who did not bother with long-drawn-out formalities, 
When a couple asked for a divorce, they granted it. Particularly famous for this was a certain rabbi in a nearby street who shall remain nameless. Who can tell? Perhaps he was driven to it by dire need. At any rate, he operated a regular divorce mill. It frequently happened that several scribes sat in his house all writing out divorces at the same time. The other Warsaw rabbis had already discussed the possibility of issuing a ban against these divorces. For some time longer, husband and wife continued to insult and curse each other in our house. They created such an uproar that the din could be heard in the street. She reminded him of all the wrongs, all the pain and shame she had borne since the day when her accursed fate had driven her to marry him. One minute she wept, and the next she shouted with an extraordinarily strong voice. Now she spoke softly, almost pleadingly, and then again she became wild. Her hands seemed to be seeking something. Had there been anything in the room that could be used to smash or hurl, she would surely have done something savage in her rage. But there were only the sacred tones. The man was silent most of this time, but when he did open his mouth, the words he spewed forth were those of a ruffian who is both frightened and ready to wage war. After much talk and argument, the couple left. Warsaw was a big city, and even Krakmalna Street was like a good-sized town. Days or even weeks passed, and we heard nothing of what had happened between those two. A quarrel between husband and wife, that happened every day, even ten times a day. There were on Krakmalna Street certain couples who, when they felt like quarreling, would go out into the street and wait for a crowd to collect. What pleasure is there in fighting quietly within one's own four walls? One day our door opened, and the man who had gambled away the stove entered. He looked thinner, rumpled, unkempt. His cheeks were sunken. The color of his reddish face had paled. His mustache was no longer stiffly curled, as though wound on springs, but drooped like that of a poor janitor. Even his boots had lost their one-time gloss. Is the rabbi in? Yes, in the other room. For a while the man remained silent, and my mother was silent too, but I could sense that both wanted to speak. At last mother said, What came of it all? Oh, Rebetzin, things are bad. What happened? We were divorced. Where? The man named the street. Mother smote her hands together. It is a shame and a disgrace. For a few rubles, some people are ready to ruin the lives of others. Again there was silence in the room. Then Mother asked, What are you, a Cohen, a Levite, an Israelite? I, I don't know. Did your father ever pronounce the priestly blessing in the synagogue? My father? The priestly blessing? No, but why do you ask? Go in to see my husband. My mother, the daughter of a rabbi, knew well what she was asking. A Levite or an Israelite may remarry the wife whom he has divorced, but a Kohen may not marry a divorced woman, not even his own former wife. Yes, the man repented what he had done. He poured out all the bitterness of his heart before my father. He himself had been angry, his wife had been overcome by rage, and the other rabbi had been hungry for the few rubles he stood to earn. But now the wrath had passed. The children cried because they missed their father. The wife was at her wit's end. He himself was sick with yearning for his wife and the little ones. Indeed, he had done wrong, but he wanted to mend his ways. He had vowed never again to hold a card in his hand, nor would he touch another drop of alcohol. He loved his wife. He was a devoted father. For his children's sake, he would gladly give his life. Now he wanted to remarry his faithful wife. You are not a Cohen, are you? Father asked quickly. The man said no. But Father sent me to the divorced wife. She was to bring her writ of divorcement or her marriage contract. Father looked at these to ascertain that the man was indeed not a Cohen. Now he was relieved. Mother also looked gay. Only now, when he was sure that the rift could be healed, did Father begin to chide the man. Was he not ashamed of himself? How could one become so engrossed in vulgar pleasures? The soul emanates directly from the throne of glory. 
It is sent to this world to be purified, not to be sullied. No one lives forever. There comes a time when each man must render an account. The man nodded assent to everything. The woman stood wringing her hands, not in father's study, but in the kitchen near the open door. She, too, had in this short time become pale, somber-looking. She showed my mother how loose her dress had become because of the weight she had lost. At night she could not sleep. There was always a lump in her throat, and yet she could not cry. And suddenly the woman began to wail in a terrifying voice, a voice that seemed hardly to issue from a human throat. Then I understood that this man and woman loved each other with a passionate love and were tied to each other by forces so strong that no divorce could sunder them. Yes, the other rabbi had taken the few rubles for the divorce, but the wedding was held in our house. Bride and groom laughed and cried simultaneously while standing under the canopy. The next Sabbath, husband and wife walked arm in arm down Krachmalna Street, their children at their side. Dread overcomes me when I think of what would have happened had this man, God forbid, been a Cohen. The Magician of Lublin Chapter 1 That morning, Yasha Mazur, or the Magician of Lublin, as he was known everywhere but in his hometown, awoke early. He always spent a day or two in bed after returning from a trip. His weariness required the indulgence of continual sleep. His wife Esther would bring him cookies, milk, a dish of groats. He would eat and doze off again. The parrot shrieked. Yoktan, the monkey, chattered. The canaries whistled and trilled, but Yasha, disregarding them, merely reminded Esther to water the horses. He need not have bothered with such instructions. She always remembered to draw water from the well for Kara and Shiva, their brace of gray mares, or, as Yasha had nicknamed them, dust and ashes. Yasha, although a magician, was considered rich. He owned a house, and with it, barns, silos, stables, a hayloft, a courtyard having two apple trees, even a garden where Esther grew her own vegetables. He lacked only children. Esther could not conceive. In every other way, she was a good wife. She knew how to knit, sew a wedding gown, bake gingerbread and tarts, tear out the pip of a chicken, apply a cupping glass or leeches, even bleed a patient. In her younger days, she had tried all sorts of remedies for barrenness, but now it was too late. She was nearly forty. Like every other magician, Yasha was held in small esteem by the community. He wore no beard and went to synagogue only on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, that is, if he happened to be in Lublin at the time. Esther, on the other hand, wore the customary kerchief and kept a kosher kitchen. She observed the Sabbath and all the laws. Yasha spent his Sabbath talking and smoking cigarettes among musicians. To the earnest moralists who attempted to get him to mend his ways, he would always answer, When were you in heaven, and what did God look like? It was risky to debate with him, since he was no fool, knew how to read Russian and Polish, and was even well informed on Jewish matters, a reckless man. To win a bet, he had once spent a whole night in the cemetery, he could walk a tightrope, skate on a wire, climb walls, open any lock. Abraham Leibush, the locksmith, had wagered five rubles he could make a lock that Yasha could not open. He had worked over it for months, and Yasha had picked it with a shoemaker's awl. In Lublin, they said that if Yasha had chosen crime, no one's house would be safe. His two days of lounging in bed were over and that morning Yasha rose with the sun. He was a short man, broad-shouldered and lean-hipped. He had unruly flaxen hair and watery blue eyes, thin lips, a narrow chin, and a short Slavic nose. His right eye was somewhat larger than his left, and because of this he always seemed to be blinking with insolent mockery. He was now forty, but looked ten years younger. His toes were almost as long and tensile as his fingers, and with a pen in them he could sign his name with a flourish. He could also shell peas with them. 
He could flex his body in any direction. It was said that he had malleable bones and fluid joints. He rarely performed in Lublin, but the few who had seen his act acclaimed his talents. He could walk on his hands, eat fire, swallow swords, turn somersaults like a monkey. No one could duplicate his skill. He would be imprisoned in a room at night with the lock clamped on the outside of the door, and the next morning he would be seen nonchalantly strolling through the marketplace while on the outside of the door the lock remained unopened. He could manage this even with his hands and feet chained. Some maintained that he practiced black magic and owned a cap which made him invisible, capable of squeezing through cracks in the wall. Others said that he was merely a master of illusion. Now he got out of bed without pouring water over his hands, as he should have done, nor did he say his morning prayers. He put on green trousers, red house slippers, and a black velvet vest decorated with silver sequins. While dressing, he capered and clowned like a schoolboy, whistled at the canaries, addressed Yoktan the monkey, spoke to Haman the dog, and to Mestotza the cat. This was only part of the menagerie he kept. In the courtyard were a peacock and peahen, a pair of turkeys, a flock of rabbits, even a snake which had to be fed a live mouse every other day. It was a warm morning just before Pentecost. Green shoots had already appeared in Esther's garden. Yasha opened the stable door and entered. He inhaled deeply the odor of horse droppings and petted the mares. Then he curry-combed them and fed the other animals. Sometimes he returned from a trip to find one of his pets gone, but this time there had been no deaths. He was in good spirits, and he strolled about his property aimlessly. The grass in the courtyard was green, and a host of flowers grew there, yellow, white, speckled buds, and tufted blossoms that dispersed with every breeze. Brush and thistle reached almost to the roof of the outhouse, Butterflies fluttered this way and that, and bees buzzed from flower to flower. Every leaf and stalk had its inhabitant, a worm, a bug, a gnat, creatures barely discernible to the naked eye. As always, Yasha marveled at them. Where did they come from? How did they exist? What did they do in the night? They died in winter, but with summer the swarms came again. How did that happen? When he was in the tavern, Yasha played the atheist, but actually he believed in God. God's hand was evident everywhere. Each fruit blossom, pebble, and grain of sand proclaimed him. The leaves of the apple trees were wet with dew and sparkled like little candles in the morning light. His house was near the edge of the city, and he could see great fields of wheat which were green now, but in six weeks would be golden yellow, ready for the harvest. Who created all this? Yasha would ask himself. Was it the sun? If so, then perhaps the sun was God. Yasha had read in some holy book that Abraham had worshipped the sun before accepting the existence of Jehovah. No, he was not illiterate. His father had been a learned man, and Yasha had even studied the Talmud as a boy. After his father's death, he had been advised to continue his education, but instead had joined a traveling circus. He was half Jew, half Gentile, neither Jew nor Gentile. He had worked out his own religion. There was a creator, but he revealed himself to no one, gave no indications of what was permitted or forbidden. Those who spoke in his name were liars. Subchapter 2 Yasha amused himself in the courtyard, and Esther prepared his breakfast. A hard roll with butter and cottage cheese, scallions, radishes, a cucumber, and coffee, which she had ground herself, and which she brewed with milk. Esther was small and dark, had a youthful face, a straight nose, black eyes in which both joy and sorrow were reflected. There were even times when those eyes would sparkle mischievously, when she smiled, her upper lip turned up playfully, revealing small teeth, and her cheeks dimpled. Since she was childless, she associated with the girls rather than with other married women. She employed two seamstresses with whom she was always joking, but it was said that when alone, she wept. 
God had sealed her womb, as it is written in the Pentateuch, and it was rumored that she spent much of what she earned on quacks and miracle workers. Once she had cried out that she even envied those mothers whose children lay in the cemetery. Now she served Yasha his breakfast. She sat opposite him on the bench and studied him, wryly, appraisingly, curiously. She never bothered him until he had had time to recover from his trip, but this morning she saw from his face that his period of recuperation was over. His being away so much had had its effect upon their relationship. They did not have the intimacy of long-married couples. Esther's small talk might have been exchanged with a casual acquaintance. Well, what's new out in the great big world? It's the same old world. And how about your magic? It's the same old magic. What about the girls? Have there been any changes there? What girls? There aren't any. No, no, of course not. I just wish I had twenty silver pieces for every girl you've had. What would you do with such a vast amount of money, he asked, winking at her. Then he returned to his food, chewing as he stared off into the distance beyond her. Her suspicions never left her, but he admitted to nothing, reassuring her after each trip that he believed in only one god and one wife. Those who run around with women don't walk tight ropes. They find it hard enough to creep around on the ground. You know that as well as I do, he argued. Just how could I know it, she asked. When you're on the road, I don't stand at the foot of your bed. And the smile that she gave him was a mixture of affection and resentment. He could not be watched over like other husbands. He spent more time on the road than at home, met all sorts of women, wandered further than a gypsy. Yes, he was as free as the wind, but thank God he always returned to her, and always with some gift in his hand. The eagerness with which he kissed and embraced her suggested that he had been living the life of a saint during his absence. But what could a mere woman know of the male appetite? Often Esther regretted that she had married a magician and not some tailor or cobbler who sat at home all day and was constantly in view. But her love for Yasha persisted. He was both son and husband to her. Every day that she spent with him was a holiday. Esther continued to study him as he ate. Somehow he did things differently from the usual run of people. While he was eating, he would suddenly pause, as if in deep thought, and then begin chewing again. Another of his odd habits was to dally with a piece of thread, idly tying knots in it, but so skillfully that an equal space would remain between each knot. Esther would gaze often into his eyes, trying to penetrate their artifice, but his impassivity always defeated her. He concealed much, seldom spoke in earnest, always hid his vexations. Even if he were ill, he would walk around burning with fever, and Esther would be none the wiser. Frequently she questioned him about the performances which had made him famous throughout Poland, but he either dismissed her questions with a curt reply, or evaded them with a joke. One moment he would be on the most intimate terms with her, and the next he would be equally remote. And she never grew tired of wondering about each move he made, each word, each gesture. Even when he was in one of his exuberant moods and babbled like a schoolboy, everything he said had meaning. Occasionally it was only after he had left and was once more on the road that Esther would understand what he had said. They had been married twenty years, but he was still as playful with her as he had been on the first day after their wedding. He would tug at her kerchief, tweak her nose, call her ridiculous nicknames, such as Jerambola, Pussy Ball, Goose Gizzard, musician's jargon she knew. Days he was one thing and nights another. One moment he crowed elatedly like a rooster, squealed like a pig, whinnied like a horse, and the next was inexplicably melancholy. At home he spent most of his time in his room, occupied with his equipment. Locks, chains, ropes, files, tongs, all sorts of odds and ends. Those who had witnessed his stunts spoke of the ease with which they were performed, but Esther had witnessed the days and nights spent perfecting his paraphernalia, she had seen him train a crow to speak like a man, watched him teach Yoktan the monkey to smoke a pipe. 
She dreaded his overworking or being bitten by one of the animals or falling from the tightrope. To Esther, he was all sorcery. Even at night in bed, she would hear him clicking his tongue or snapping his toes. His eyes were those of a cat. He could see in the dark. He knew how to locate missing articles. He was even able to read her thoughts. Once she had had a quarrel with one of the seamstresses, and Yasha, coming in late that night, had scarcely spoken to her before divining that she had had an argument that day. Another time she had lost her wedding ring and searched everywhere for it before she had told him of the loss. He had taken her by the hand and had led her to the water barrel where the ring lay at the bottom. She had long since come to the conclusion that she would never be able to understand all his complexities. He possessed hidden powers. He had more secrets than the blessed Rosh Hashanah pomegranate has seeds. Subchapter 3 it was midday, and Bella's tavern was almost deserted. Bella was dozing in a back room, and the bar was tended by her small assistant, Sipora. Fresh sawdust had been sprinkled on the floor, and roast goose, jellied calf's foot, chopped herring, egg cookies, pretzels had been laid out on the counter. Yasha sat at a table with Shmuel the musician. Shmuel was a large man with bushy black hair, black eyes, sideburns, and a thin mustache. He was dressed in the Russian manner, a satin blouse, tasseled belt, and high boots. For several years, Shmuel had worked for a Zhitomir nobleman, but having become involved with the wife of his patron's steward, had had to flee. Considered Lublin's most accomplished violinist, he always performed at the more exclusive weddings. This, however, was the period between Passover and Pentecost, a time of no weddings. Shmuel had a mug of beer before him. He leaned against the wall, one eye screwed up, the other contemplating the beverage, as if debating whether to drink or not. On the table was a roll, and on the roll a large golden green fly, which also seemed unable to come to a decision. Should it fly off or not? Yasha had not yet tasted his beer. He seemed entranced by the foam. One by one, the bubbles in the brimming glass disintegrated until it was only three-quarters full. Yasha murmured, Swindle, swindle, bubble, bubble. Shmuel had just been bragging about one of his amorous adventures. And now, at the end of one story and before the beginning of another, the men sat silently thoughtful. Yasha enjoyed listening to Shmuel's stories. He could have replied in kind, had he wished, but with the pleasure evoked by Shmuel's story came an inner gnawing, an ominous feeling of doubt. Let's assume he's telling the truth, Yasha thought. Then who is deceiving whom? Aloud, he said, It doesn't sound like much of a triumph to me. You captured a soldier who wanted to surrender. Well, you've got to catch them at the right moment. In Lublin, it's not as easy as you think. You see some girl, she wants you, you want her. The problem is how can the cat climb the fence? Let's say you're at a wedding. When it's over, she goes home with her husband, and you don't even know where she lives. And even if you do know, what good is it? There's her mother, her mother-in-law, her sisters, and her sisters-in-law. You don't have such problems, Yasha. Once you're on the other side of the city gate, the world is yours. All right, come along with me. You'd take me? I'll do more than that. I'll pay your expenses. Yes, and what would Yentl say? When a man has children, he's not free anymore. You won't believe me, but I'd miss the kids. I leave town for a few days, and I'm half crazy. Can you understand that? I? I understand everything. Despite yourself, you get involved. It's as if you took a rope and tied yourself with it. What would you do if your wife carried on like the one you were telling me about? Shmuel's face suddenly became serious. Believe me, I'd strangle her. And he lifted the mug to his lips and drained its contents. Well, he's no different from anyone else, Yasha thought as he sipped his beer. It's what we're all after. But how do you manage it? For quite some time now, Yasha had been involved in this very dilemma. It disturbed him day and night. Of course, he had always been a soul-searcher, prone to fantasy and strange conjecture. But since the advent of Amelia, his mind was never quiet. He had evolved into a regular philosopher. 
Now, instead of swallowing his beer, he rolled the bitterness around on his tongue, gums, and palate. In the past, he had sowed every variety of wild oats, had tangled and disentangled himself on numerous occasions, but in some final sense his marriage had remained sacred to him. He had never concealed that he had a wife, and he had always made it clear that he would do nothing that would jeopardize this relationship. But Amelia demanded that he sacrifice everything, his home, his religion, nor were these all that were required. Somehow or other he must raise a vast amount of money, but how could he accomplish that honestly? No, I must end the thing, he told himself, and the sooner the better. Shmuel twirled his mustache and moistened it with saliva to get the ends nicely pointed. How's Magda? he asked. Yasha woke from his reverie. How should she be? She's just the same. Her mother's still living? Yes. Have you taught the girl anything? Some things. What, for instance? She can spin a barrel with her feet and do somersaults. Is that all? That's it. Someone showed me a newspaper from Warsaw, and there was a great to-do about you in it. <laughs> what a fuss. They say you're as good as Napoleon III's magician. What sleight of hand, eh, Yasha? You really are a master of deception. Shmuel's words jarred him. Yasha did not like to discuss his magic, and for a moment he disputed with himself, finally deciding, I won't answer at all. But aloud he said, I don't deceive anyone. No, of course not. You really swallow the sword. Of course I do. Go tell that to your grandma. You big simpleton. How can anyone deceive the eye? You happen to hear the word deception, and you keep repeating it like a parrot. Do you have any idea what the word means? Look, the sword does go down the throat and not into the vest pocket. The blade goes into your throat? First the throat and then the stomach. And you stay alive? I have so far. Oh, Yasha, please don't expect me to believe that. Who gives a damn what you believe, Yasha said, suddenly becoming weary. Shmuel was nothing but a loud-mouthed fool who could not think for himself. They see with their own eyes, but they don't believe, Yasha thought. As for Shmuel's wife, Yentl, he knew something about her that would have driven that big blockhead insane. Well, everyone has something that he keeps to himself. Each person has his secrets. If the world had ever been informed of what went on inside of him, he, Yasha, would have long ago been committed to a madhouse. Subchapter 4 The dusk descended. Beyond the city there was still some light, but among the narrow streets and high buildings it was already dark. In the shops oil lamps and candles were lit. Bearded Jews, dressed in long cloaks and wearing wide boots, moved through the streets on their way to evening prayers. A new moon arose, the moon of the month of Sivan. There were still puddles in the streets, vestiges of the spring rains, even though the sun had been blazing down on the city all day. Here and there, sewers had flooded over with rank water. The air smelled of horse and cow dung and milk fresh from the udder. Smoke came from the chimneys. Housewives were busy preparing the evening meal. Groats with soup, groats with stew, groats with mushrooms. Yasha said goodbye to Shmuel and started for home. The world beyond Lublin was in turmoil. Every day the Polish newspapers screamed war, revolution, crisis. Jews everywhere were being driven from their villages. Many were emigrating to America. But here in Lublin one felt only the stability of a long-established community. Some of the town's synagogues had been built as long ago as the time of Chmelnitsky. Rabbis were buried in the cemetery, as well as authors of commentaries, legists, and saints, each under his tombstone or chapel. Old customs prevailed here. The women conducted business, and the men studied the Torah. Pentecost was still several days off, but the Cheder boys had already decorated the windows with numerous designs and cutouts. There were also birds molded out of dough and eggshells, and leaves and branches had been brought in from the countryside in honor of the holiday, the day on which the Torah had been given on Mount Sinai. Yasha paused at one of the prayer houses and glanced in. 
The worshippers were chanting the evening services. He heard a tranquil buzz. They were saying the 18 benedictions. Pious Jews who served their creator the year round beat their breasts, crying, We have sinned, we have transgressed. Some raised their hands, others their eyes heavenward. A gabardined old man with a high-crowned hat over two skull caps, one behind the other, tugged at his white beard and moaned softly. Shadows danced on the walls to the flickering of the one memorial candle in the menorah. For a moment, Yasha lingered at the open door, inhaling the mixture of wax, tallow, and something musty, something which he remembered from childhood. Jews, an entire community of them, spoke to a god no one saw. All the plagues, famines, poverty, and pogroms were his gifts to them. They deemed him merciful and compassionate, and proclaimed themselves his chosen people. Yasha often envied their unswerving faith. He stood there for a moment before continuing. The street lamps were lit, but it made little difference. They scarcely illumined their own darkness. Since there were no customers in sight, it was hard to understand why the shops remained open. Kerchiefs on their shaven skulls, the shop women sat darning their men's socks or sewing little aprons and undershirts for their grandchildren. Yasha knew them all. Married at fourteen or fifteen, they had become grandmothers in their thirties. Old age, prematurely invited, had puckered their faces, stolen their teeth, and left them benign and affectionate. Though Yasha, like his father and grandfather, had been born here, he remained a stranger, not simply because he had cast off his Jewishness, but because he was always a stranger here and in Warsaw, amongst Jews as well as Gentiles. They were all settled, domesticated, while he kept moving. They had children and grandchildren. There were none for him. They had their God, their saints, their leaders. He had only doubt. Death meant paradise to them, but to him only dread. What came after life? Was there such a thing as a soul? And what happened to it after it left the body? Since early childhood he had listened to tales of dibooks, ghosts, werewolves, and hobgoblins. He himself had experienced events unexplained by natural law. But what did it all mean? He became increasingly confused and withdrawn. Within him, forces raged, passions reduced him to terror. In the darkness as he walked, Amelia's face loomed before him, narrow, olive-skinned, with black Jewish eyes, a Slavic turned-up nose, dimpled cheeks, a high forehead, the hair combed straight back, a dark fuzz shadowing the upper lip. She smiled, shy and lustful at once, and eyed him with an inquisitiveness both worldly and sisterly, he wanted to put out his hand to touch her. Was his imagination so vivid, or was this truly a vision? Her image moved backwards, like a holy placard in a religious procession. He saw details of her coiffure, the lace around her neck, the earrings in her ears. He yearned to call her by name. None of his past affairs could compare with this one. Asleep and awake, he hungered for her. Now that fatigue had left him, he could scarcely wait for the Pentecost to pass so that he could be with her in Warsaw again. He had not assuaged his passion through Esther, though he had tried. Someone jostled him. It was Haskell, the water-bearer, with two buckets of water on his yoke. He seemed to have sprung out of the earth. The red beard picked up glints of light from somewhere. Haskell, is it you? Who else? Isn't it late to carry water? I need money for the holidays. Yasha rummaged in his pocket, found a twenty-groschen piece. Here, Haskell. Haskell bristled. What's this? I don't take alms. It's not alms. It's for your boy to buy himself a butter cookie. All right, I'll take it. And thanks. And Haskell's dirty fingers intertwined for a moment with Yasha's. Yasha came to his house and looked into the window. The seamstresses were working on a trousseau for a bride. The thimbled fingers sewed swiftly. In the lamplight, a seamstress's red hair seemed aflame. Esther bustled around the stove, adding pine twigs to the tripod on which the supper was cooking. A trough of dough in the center of the room was covered with rags and a cushion. Esther was about to bake a batch of butter cookies from it for the Pentecost. 
Can I leave her? Yasha thought. During all these years, she's been my only support. Were it not for her devotion, I would have long since drifted like a leaf in a windstorm. He did not go immediately into his rooms, but walked down the corridor into the courtyard to look in on the mares. The courtyard was like a patch of country in the midst of a city. The grass was dewy, the apples green and raw, but already fragrant. The sky here seemed lower, more dense, with stars. As Yasha walked into the courtyard, a star somewhere in space detached itself and plummeted, trailing a fiery wake. The air smelled half sweet, half acrid, alive with rustlings, ferment, and crickets chirping, which every once in a while became a loud ringing. Field mice scurried about. Moles had burrowed humps in the ground. Birds' nests were in the branches of trees, in the barn, and the roof eaves. Chickens dozed in the hayloft. Each night the fowl bickered quietly over the disputed porch space, Yasha breathed deeply. Strange that every star was larger than the earth and millions of miles beyond it. If one were to dig a ditch thousands of miles deep into the earth, one would come up in America, 